Yeah. All right. Well, as we were talking about timing, what, what I do, the talk will last for about an hour. The first half hour, 40 minutes, I'll talk about some of my background, the history. I'll tell a lot of stories, anecdotes of places, people, books, things that I've seen, characters. Uh, I hope all of you watch Antiques Roadshow, but I'll tell a few stories about Antiques Roadshow, which I've done for about 20 years. Uh, and then the last 10 or 15 minutes, I'll do a few appraisals. A few people submitted things uh, and I can do a couple of them. Also, I can do some question and answer. The time is somewhat limited. I, I'm looking very much forward to very soon being able to do these talks live. And then I can do appraisals really fast. Uh, Zoom, it takes a little bit longer. And then I'll end the talk with one or two uh, quick uh, stories and so on. And like I say, I keep it to an hour, partly because uh, my wife likes to say I only work half a day. I get into the store at 5.30 in the morning. The store closes at 5.30. So I only work 12 hours and that's half a day. And when I do these talks, I go even a little longer. So. Uh, let me first give a little bit of background of the store and who I am. The history of the Brattle Bookshop goes back to the 1820s. But for all practical purposes, it was going out of business in 1949. My father was getting married. My mother had $500. They bought half interest in the Brattle Bookshop. And uh, my father built the store with his great love of books, his hard work, his knowledge. He was a bit of a character and a showman. And it's always been in Boston. We get calls constantly from Harvard Square on Brattle Street, where are you? We tell them we're downtown. When my parents first bought the store, there was a little side street called Brattle Street, which was in the Scully Square area. To make it even more confusing, the street doesn't exist anymore. It's where Boston City Hall Plaza is now. And uh, when my father would move the store, Every time he'd move, when it was planned, he would move the best books to his new location and then he'd run sales. Half price dollar, 50 cent quarter dime. Last day of the sale though, everything was free. And he would literally have hundreds of people line up with bags, packs, satchels, whatever, run, uh, ring a big bell. They'd go charging into the store, grab whatever they could grab. Five minutes later, he'd ring the bell again. That group would leave, the next group would come in and he gave away over 250,000 books that way. Now, the last time he did this was in 1969, and we were moving from the end of Washington Street to West Street, where we are now. And at the end of the giveaway, there were books left over. And like I say, my father was a bit of a character and a showman, and if you can sort of picture this, he hired a covered wagon with a cowboy and a horse team, and on the cover of the covered wagon, it said, go West, book lovers. Go 5 West Street, Brattle Bookshop. They filled it up with books and they drove it from the end of Washington Street near Boston City Hall, up Court Street, down Tremont by the Boston Common to where West Street is, and then back down Washington Street with my father sitting in back, throwing books out the whole way. Now, the superintendent in charge of traffic was a friend of his, told him he could do it all morning, but within an hour, the city was in an absolute standstill they told him to stop. He didn't care. He'd gotten his point across. And we've been on West Street since then. When we first moved in, we were in a five-story, 150-year-old wooden building, absolutely crammed full of books. In February of 1980, I got a call at four o'clock in the morning. The building was on fire and it literally burnt to the ground. I mean, it was 100% gone, but we wanted to continue to keep going, not go out of business. We found a storefront a few doors away. We rented folding tables. People either sold, gave us, donated books. Kevin White, who was the mayor at the time, came in with a carload of books. And even though it was a meager stock, within a month we reopened. And we had no insurance. Matter of fact, it cost more to demolish the building than we had insurance. So there was no insurance. But the main thing was continue to keep going, not go out of business. And over the next four years, we slowly but surely rebuilt the stock. Four years after that, we bought the building we're in now, which is again, a few doors down on West Street. It's sort of the old Dickensian type of store. Outside stands at a dollar three and five. 
two floors of general used books, a third floor with rare books, autographs, manuscripts, leather bindings, and so on. And that type of business is a dying business. And it's not dying because you don't have, people don't want books, buy books, sell books, read books, but particularly in the inner cities, property value has gone so high, that rent has gone so high, that old bookstores, which I can assure you that aren't the most, re, uh, they aren't the most efficient businesses in the world. One right after the other have been going out of business. And in the last few years, the internet has speeded that along. But in COVID didn't help, but we're still here and I plan on doing this for a long time to come. And I've done this all my life. My parents say my first word was book. I really don't know, maybe it was, I'm sure they were talking about them all the time. And I worked after school in elementary school, junior high school, high school, summers during college. I have a degree in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts. In 1973, I was gonna get a doctorate at the University of Wisconsin, but I needed a year off. My father's health wasn't that good. That year now has been almost 50 years. And I don't regret for a minute that I'm doing this and not in a laboratory uh, somewhere. And I have daughters who are in their mid thirties. I don't think they have any interest in coming into it the way I have. And one of the fascinating parts about doing this business, and I'll talk about going out to houses and estates. It's almost like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure Island, never knowing who you're gonna see, what you're gonna find, the people, the places, the characters. And, and also it's the customers and even it's the people who work here sometimes. Uh, I remember I hired an employee, this was when I first started and the person, he ended up working for us for 17 years. So I, uh, he was a very good employee, but he had worked there a couple of days. And I remember a, a man came in, an older man. Well, I considered him older at the time. I don't know whether he's, I'm older than he is now, but whatever came in and he asked for an obscure author called Doniford Yates, fiction novelist. I knew who it was. I went over to the section. We didn't have anything. And I said, would you like to leave your name? Because at that time we took cards and kept files. And he said, no, maybe I'll check again sometime. He left. And my new employee comes up to me, he goes, does that man come in here often? And I said, well, you know, I really wasn't paying that much attention, but no, I didn't, you know, no. He says, oh, well, that was J.D. Salinger. I used to date his daughter. So you never know what's gonna happen. And then this employee uh, who on the second day telling me that he dated J.D. Salinger's daughter, one time had about a month later had one of the most memorable introductions that I've ever had. My wife had four tickets for a Celtics game. And we said, Hugh, would you like to come with us? He said, sure, but give me the tickets, I'll meet you there. My wife and I get there, he's sitting there with a woman and the introduction is, this is my wife, Mickey. We're getting divorced tomorrow. What do you say to an introduction like that? But they were both happy and smiling. So you never know what you're gonna get. And, and uh, like I say, the people and the characters. Um, and, like I said, the fun part is going out to houses and I'll, I'll relate a few of those stories. Um, I got a call, I was out of the store and I got back and there was a message that a Mrs. Fisher had called, had some books in Providence. And I called her up and she said, oh yes, my father died. He has 500 art reference books. We want to get the best price we can. We're going to invite a number of dealers down to bid on them. Would you be interested? Well, 500 art reference books is sounded very interesting. They lived in Providence, that's only an hour away. I mean, just last week I drove to Philadelphia to pick up books. So we go all over the Northeast and uh, so an hour is nothing. Uh, an interesting thing that I found on driving is I've had a number of times where people have called me to go to Albany. And then I've had people call me to go to Provincetown and everybody goes, oh, well, Provincetown, that's really close. It's actually a longer ride from Boston to Provincetown than it is Boston to Albany. It's, it's, they, they, so it's a lot of it's related and relative. But in any case, I get called, the, this family lived on Benefit Street, which was an old street up near Brown University. 
get to the house. It's a large old colonial house. Get led through the house into a courtyard, into a garage, second floor of the garage. They had 5,000 books. Well, it turned out her married name was Fisher. Her father's name was John Nicholas Brown. Family founded Brown University, one of the wealthier families in the country. And after about six months, I bought about 80% of the books I wanted. I was happy, she was pleased. And she said, my mother has a lot of books. Most are being given to the university. Some are being sold at auction, but would you like to go to Newport to take a look at the books there? Well, their house in Newport is one of the mansions on the ocean. I mentioned this to my wife. She decided to come with me on this deal. And one of the fascinating parts about it was being in one of those mansions that was still being lived in by a family. And at one point wandering from the basement to the attic all on my own without a tour guide saying, come here, go there, do it. But literally just wandering through the whole place. It was fascinating. Another time I got called to Newport to do an appraisal. Now, when I do talks like this, I do hundreds of free appraisals. Matter of fact, my goal is that whenever you think of an old book, you think of me and the Brattle Bookshop. I don't care if you think of 10 others. And matter of fact, you have some very good shops down near you, Isaiah Thomas, Titcombs, Parnassus a little further down. So there are a lot of good bookstores around, but I like to be thought of as one of them. And one of the ways I feel I can do that is by giving out as much free information as reasonable. But there are times when people need very formal written appraisals for insurance, estate taxes, whatever, then I discuss a fee. In any case, another mansion in Newport, not quite as big as the Browns. This was the Perry family, Commodore Perry, Oliver Hazard Perry. And what they had was a whole stack of papers from the war of 1812. During the war, their family were privateers. Well, they're privateers if you're on our side. They're pirates if you're on the other side. It's all the way you look at it. And it was a day-to-day -day accounting of the ships. And they would sometimes capture a ship and realize tens of thousands of dollars profit. In 1812, that was an incredible amount of money. Then one day, one of the ships got into a battle. The ship got hit. The captain got hit. He lost his leg. Three days later, there was a tiny entry at the bottom of the page, and it said, Captain. $5 bonus, loss of leg. And that was the last you heard of the captain. So that's changed a lot too. When my father was still alive and he died over 30 years ago, we got a call from a lady. She was very vague about her name, who she was, what she had, but she lived close by. She was in Sharon and we figured, you know, let's go and see what it is. Get to the house, a little ranch house, paint was peeling, weeds were growing. You sort of say to yourself, oh, gee, what's going to be here? She answered the door. She was quite elderly, but we walk in and there were just gorgeous antiques everywhere. I mean, really, really beautiful antiques. And she got to talking. Turned out she was originally from the Boston area, but she had married the prince of the Ukraine, the cousin of the Tsar of Russia. He had escaped just before the revolution. And she told story after story about being Russian nobility in Europe and all the court intrigues and all the goings on, how T.E. Shaw used to stay at their house all the time, how she didn't think he accidentally died on a motorcycle, but there was a lot more to it. T.E. Shaw, of course, was Lawrence of Arabia. And she went on and on and on with these wonderful stories. Turned out her books were lousy, but the stories were absolutely wonderful. And when we first got into her house on one of her walls, she had 10 watercolors. They were sort of pastoral European scenes. I thought they were nice. And the more she talked and the longer we were there and the more I looked at them, the nicer I th thought they were. And I finally said to her, you know, those 10 watercolors, they're really nice. And she turned around and said, oh yes, they were all Turners. So she had 10 original Turner watercolors, probably a million dollars worth of paintings. And it was like, oh yes. So you never know, and it's the people, the characters, what you're gonna see. Speaking of characters, about 20 years ago, we went to one of our customers' 100th birthday parties. Now, when you go to a man's 100th birthday party, and he tells you he just got back from Barcelona, he's going to give a talk in Florida, and he's been asked to lecture in Tokyo. And I finally said to him, wait a minute, you're 100 years old. Don't you think Tokyo is an awfully long way to go? And he said, well, when I used to work, it took me well over 25 hours to get to Chicago. 
He says, I don't think Tokyo is a whole lot further than that nowadays. And here's a man who could tell you about one day sitting down to dinner with Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. He said he was very excited about this dinner and the learning and insight he was going to get from these men. So he was excited. He got there about five minutes early, sat down at the table. He said about five minutes later, Ford came in and sat down next to him. He said about 15 minutes later, Edison came in. Now Edison was elderly, had one of those big, huge horns for hearing, sat down opposite. He said the first thing, Ford turned to Edison and yelled, my Tom, you look very good. And Edison turned to Ford and yelled, it's the Cotter's little liver pills. This man said all night long, all they did was yell about Cotter's little liver pills. And he said, next time he wanted to learn something, he went to the library. So I can go on and on with those stories. I'll tell one more and then uh, I'll talk about some collections and things that I've seen and touched and both rare and unusual. Uh, I got a call from a lady. Uh, well, we get hundreds of calls at the store. People wanting to know, do you have a book? Can you get a book? How hard is it to get the book? Does the book exist? Or what's the value? How much is it worth? And either I or the people I work with, we can answer most of those questions right off the top of our head. Some take a little work and every once in a while you really have to do some research, but that can be fun too. But you get a call that really stands out. Not, not often, but you get them. I answer the phone and th again, this was quite a while ago. I answer the phone, hello, Brattle Bookshop, can I help you? Lady, elderly, thick Irish bro. And the first thing she says is, President Kennedy slept with me. Now you have to admit that gets your attention. She stopped and waited for it to sink in. And she went on to explain that she had worked for the Kennedy family. And when he was two and three years old, he used to fall asleep in her arms. So he did sleep with her, but maybe not what you first think. And what she had was a whole series of handwritten letters from the president. Now presidential letters of any type have value. But handwritten letters from a later 20th century president are particularly rare, hard to get, scarce and valuable. She wanted to get an offer on them. I was actually a little bit skeptical about that, but I thought she'd be fun to meet. I went to her house. She was great, loads of stories. The letters were fabulous. I gave her what I thought was a tremendous offer, but much as I suspected, there was no way she could sell these letters. The letters were part of her life. I left a note behind, as far as I know, her family still has them, probably where they belong. Maybe someday I'll hear about them again, but you, you never know. And one of the things that comes up, and, and these are a couple of things that sort of, uh, sort of came up in the last few days, but uh, I'll mention them and they, they lead into stories. When we get calls, people call up, they're moving, they whatever, uh, the main reason people sell books, there's a million reasons they sell books. Main reasons is it's an older person, a couple moving from the big to the small, or it's an estate. And usually our first question we ask people is, how many books do you have? And usually the first answer is a lot. Then we say, well, what kind of books do you have? Uh, and then they say, well, the answer usually is fiction and nonfiction, which is every book ever done. So we try to we try to cut get a little more information, and usually you can or nowadays just photographs. People send us photographs of their shelves, and it gives us a good idea. But uh, about a month ago, I got a man. He said my cousin died. He was in a suburb just outside of Boston. He says it's five hundred books on sports and mysteries, and you know they're good condition. And I, it was sort of marginal whether I'd go, but. I figured, yeah, sure, maybe there's something interesting there. And it, it was only about 20 minutes away. Get to the house. He said they had, his cousin had 500 books. They had 20,000 books. Now, how you go from 500 to 20,000, except the house was so packed with everything that there were whole rooms that you really, until you could get into the room, you couldn't see. But, you know, people think a lot of the book business is, you sit behind the desk, you open up an old and rare book, you do some research, you sit and discuss it with your customers. They don't think about how do you move 20,000 books, which we did, or in a 95 degree day, if you buy a thousand books in a fifth floor walk up, uh, 
you know, you've got to move a thousand books in a fifth floor walk up. It's a incredibly physical. And then there was a, today I was pricing some books and, and it sort of shows how times have changed a little and the computer has affected tremendously uh, things. With business still goes on, people still love books. If anything, I'm finding more and more younger people are coming in. Books are almost retro, uh, but they like them and they buy them. But uh, there are certain types of books that don't sell anymore. Reference books. I mean, when's the last any of you bought an encyclopedia? Dictionaries even. But it goes way beyond that. Art books. You know, people used to have these libraries of art books so they could see the pictures. Well, now you just Google it, it comes up. The art books you don't need anymore. Even to the point, I had a friend who retired recently and he said, I've retired, but I think I'm going to take up tennis again. Do you have any good books on how to play tennis? And we looked and we had a couple. He says, those are nice. But he said, YouTube is just much better because you can actually see them. So anything that you just need the information, uh, the internet is, is replacing a lot of that. The other thing was I was pricing some books this morning in a library we just got. And these were books that 20 years ago before the internet were hard to get scholarly and they would all be priced between 25 and $75. I mean, it, it, because they were, you know, when people came in, if they saw them, they'd buy them. I just for fun looked a few up on some of the online services. I was finding 10, 20, 30 copies of them because they actually weren't rare. They were just hard to get. So all of them are $10. So they went from, so a lot of things, the, the price has gone down because they, there's just so much more access. And actually that's good. It's a good thing for society. It's a good thing that you can get all this information or you can Google it. I have a daughter who lives in Africa. The fact that she can just get on a computer and access this is great. It's maybe not the best thing for a used bookstore. Uh, and then, uh, Another thing came up, uh, this was a while ago. We make appointments, we go out to estates and houses almost every day. It's again, that's the fun part. But every once in a while, and uh, you get a call and you set up an appointment. And then just before you're about to go out there, the person calls and says, for whatever reason, maybe health, something else came up, they postpone. And it's a little bit frustrating, just not so much that you don't understand, but you blocked out that time, you could have been doing something else. We had a regular customer, friend actually, and he did this three or four times and I was starting to get frustrated. I finally said to him, look, do this once more, but if you cancel on us, I'm just not gonna go. I mean, it, it, it you know, I, I've done this four times, this will be the fifth. And of course, what happens that morning? I get a call from him and he says, it was in a storage area, one of those public storage areas, a very good one because it was all, you had electricity in the storage units and all that. And he said, but it's not my fault, really it isn't. He goes, you just can't come. And he said, well, there, there's a situation in the storage unit next to mine. He said, there was a lady who rented it for 35 years she was, uh, she had a family, but her husband had run out on her 35 years ago. He was abusive and an alcoholic, but, but she had been, you know, had this storage unit. And he said, she was on her deathbed the other day, uh, last week. And she said to her daughter, you know, your father didn't really uh, run out on the family. There's a freezer in the storage unit and your father's there. So, literally in the storage unit next to the guy was the father had been in this freezer for 35 years. And I said to him, that's the best excuse I've ever heard. Maybe not for the father, but it was on the news that night. So it wasn't like anyone's making up the story. So some of these stories, you, it's, it's amazing when you deal with a lot of people, what you're going to see or what's going to happen. And one of the things that's, um, uh, nice is again a lot of the people that you meet uh, you you never know and in a lot of the collections that people have there are some unusual ones i one time gave a talk uh well actually i did it every year with three or four other panelists it was called career day to a fifth grade 
I think it was in Westwood, but it might have been, I'm pretty sure it was Westwood. And I look forward to it because it was nice talking to fifth graders. And what I used to do, there were 50 or 60 of them. And I used to always bring newspapers from the mid 1800s. I always have piles of them. Some are very valuable. I love newspapers, but some of them, you get piles of them and they're, I give them out to every kid at the thing and they can have a 100, 150 year old newspaper. And every once in a while, I, I get some uh, response. Uh, they say, thank you. And one of the best ones I ever got, there was, this is a fifth grader and he goes, you know, I really don't collect books or the newspaper. The newspaper was interesting. He says, but what I collect is coins. And he said, I looked at my collection. I had a coin from that year. He says, what if somebody had bought that newspaper with that coin? And I just thought, boy, this kid's, if he can put that together. And it was one of the things I said, yeah, that would have been amazing. And the things that you get to hold and touch. I mean, I, I deal with this all the time, but you, you have a letter of Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, Einstein, and you get to touch it. And even though I deal with this, it can send a chill up your spine every time. I mean, they actually touch this piece, but piece of paper. They put their thoughts down on it. Uh, I one time got called to a museum to do an appraisal for insurance. They were loaning an object to another museum. And they needed an insurance value. And I said, I, I was a member of the museum and I said, I'll do it for free, but I don't wanna do it from your website. I don't want to do it uh, from a picture or copies. I want to see the original. And they said, fine, you know, just come down. We'll do that. It was a four page handwritten account of Paul Revere's ride by Paul Revere. So you're sitting there holding and reading Paul Revere's account, telling you how the British told him to get off his horse so they'd blow his head off, how the ride, I mean, that something like that actually exists and you can hold it and touch it, it is, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, and there's one question that comes up a lot and uh, what's the most valuable thing or what's the things that have really made an impression on me? And a few of them are valuable, but I'll, I'll hold off what I think is the most valuable. I got called in once to uh, do an appraisal again in Drake near, near Lowell. Guy called into a house by uh, a man, he was in his mid thirties and he had some books and there was some nice books. And then on his kitchen table was this big roll of paper. It was a teletype roll, big round roll of paper. And uh, I look at it. It was the original manuscript for On the Road. The Jack Kerouac, he wrote it in stream of consciousness. So in, rather than taking paper and out, he did it on a teletype roll. It's sitting there on this kitchen table. I got to pick it up. I got to touch it. I got to unroll it a few feet. It was too fragile to do more. I didn't get to buy it. It sold at auction for two and a half million dollars. But it turned out Jack Kerouac was his uncle. So again, you get called in. You never know. And then to sort of jump to another side of it, uh, we got a large collection of cookbooks in a, a number of years ago. It was about 2000 cookbooks and they were, they went back to the 1700s, the 1800s and then more modern, but it was a really good collection. Uh, and it was 2000 books and a lot of work, but it, it was good. And we were looking forward to going through it. But there was also a box of those sort of pamphlets like Baker Chocolate Company, how to make jello, those little things that come with uh, refrigerators and how to make this and that, you know, things selling powdered goods, flour. And some of them are really colorful, really nice. But I said to my st uh, one of the staff members, I said, look, just put them out on the dollar table. They're good. Some of them are a bargain, but we don't have the time. Just whatever, it'll be fine. About two hours later, a man comes running in with one of them. And he was beside himself. I mean, he was thrilled. He was overjoyed. He had this family. He says, I've been looking for this for years and years and years. And it's out there and it's a dollar and I found it. And I look at the title and the title is Coconuts and Constipation. 
So you never ever know what somebody's going to be looking for or find, and and uh, but that's one of the fun parts of it. Uh, another story I have is a. Uh, is about uh, John Grisham. I, I won't go into all the details, but there's a book called Camino Island that he put out a few years ago. And uh, I have an inscribed copy that says, to Ken, I owe you a dinner over this, John Grisham. Someday if someone calls me or comes in and asks me about the, read the book, you might figure out what it is, but otherwise let me know and I'll, I'll fill you in on the story. Now, uh, one of the things that I hope everybody here watches is the Antiques Roadshow. It's a lot of fun. COVID has sort of turned it on its head, uh, but uh, they're going to get a season together this year. But I've been doing it for about 20 years. And one of the great fun parts about doing Antiques Roadshow is that you get to travel all around the country. I mean, why would I ever go to Boise, uh, Albuquerque, Omaha, but anywhere you go in this country, if you have any time or make any type of effort, the people are wonderful. There's always something beautiful to see. It's gorgeous. Don't talk about politics and religion. That's not a good idea. But, uh, and then we go out to dinner with each other. But one of the things that many people don't realize about Antiques Roadshow is, uh, there's probably three to 5,000 people who come to a show. Each person brings two items. Um, they tape a little over a hundred to do the short uh, appraisals and the larger appraisals. In that you appraise all day, one day from about 7.30 in the morning, sometimes to six, seven at night. And that's what they get for three hours of television. But as an appraiser, you have to get there a little early, but also they don't pay us anything. It's all volunteer. We pay our own airfare, we pay our own hotels, meals. I mean, it's public television, but of course we get the good PR and, and um, so that's worth it. But also there's no guarantee that you're gonna get on television. No, it's people are bringing things to you all day long, but unless someone brings something that is interesting, that they don't know everything there is to know about it and probably has some value, you could spend a whole day, the time, money, and effort in as an appraiser not get on TV. Now, obviously the guests who come in want to get on TV, but what a lot of people don't realize is the appraisers want to get on TV too, almost as much. And a really good day at the Antiques Roadshow for an appraiser is eight o'clock in the morning, somebody comes in, they have a really interesting item. There's a great story behind it. They don't know the value or they don't know some key thing about it. You call a producer over, the producer talks to you, talks to the guest, goes, film it, go on. By nine o'clock in the morning, you film something. So the rest of the day is pretty easy because you know you've already been on TV and it just sort of goes by, maybe a second thing comes in, maybe not. But if you're getting to 4.35 in the afternoon and you haven't taped, it starts getting really tense because you might not find something. So there was one city, it was Kansas City actually, I was there about 8.30, 9 in the morning, a man comes in and he has a few things from uh, Pope John Paul, a few signed things and some rosary beads and they're nice, but there's nothing really to it. But then he pulls out some photographs. It turns out he was the pilot that flew the Pope and his entourage around the country in the 70s when Pope John Paul came and he had all sorts of stories about the Pope and his entourage and the things going on behind the scenes. And then there was this one photograph. Usually when you see the Pope and he was in his full vestments and dressed as the Pope, usually when you see him, he's standing there. He has his hand out with his ring. People are kneeling and kissing the ring. Very, very formal. This photograph is the pilot in his pilot's uniform, sitting in the pilot chair. The Pope is standing behind his shoulder with one leg up in the air, reaching over and signing the pilot's Bible. I mean, so you've got this great picture of the Pope signing the Bible. And I'm going, I'm saying to myself, this is great, a great story, fantastic, signed Bible. And I look at the man, I go, let me see the Bible. And he goes, oh, I didn't bring that. And I go, 
can you go get it? He goes, no, it's in, in the safe deposit and the bank's closed today. And I'm going, ah. <laughs> Later on in the day, someone brought in something. I didn't think it was quite as interesting, but it was like, oh, so frustrating. Uh, but, you know, that's that's sort of the fun part in, in the people. And, uh, and then speaking of collections, a lot of times when people call me up, they, I say one of the hardest parts to go through when you're selling books, when most people are, is the first thing I tell them is go through the collection with you, your family, anyone else involved. And if there's anything of sentimental value, pull it out, put it aside. Because I can look at books very, very quickly. And, and basically I'm looking at value. And money is easy. You either It either works or it doesn't work. But the sentiment, the emotional attachment, sometimes, oh, wait a minute, uncle so-and-so gave me this book. I remember when, or I remember when we were in Texas and we bought that book and all of that is good and I totally understand it, but I don't need to be there for that. On the other hand, I was cleaning out my father's library and what normally would have taken me maybe an hour or two to go through the whole collection, uh, I was had to spend like three or four months because I had to look at everything. When I was near to finish, my father, had, I looked and there was a box and in that box were these eight by 10 photographs of movie scenes, movie stills. And I'm going, I, I know my father liked movies, but I didn't see that he collected them. And there were about three or 400 of them in this box. And I started looking at it. And then I realized what it was. If you looked at these pictures from the movies, every single one of them had a book in it. Maybe it was the act of holding a book. Maybe there was a picture in the background with someone with a book in it. Maybe there was a library behind them. Maybe there was a picture with a picture with a book in it, but maybe there was a book, so, but all of these, there were books in it. And um, a friend of my father's really liked it. I ended up uh, giving, selling it to him. I always sort of regretted it because I loved, the more I think of it, the more I like the collection. And I don't collect books. That's something that people ask. Although I will talk about one collection we have. Um, and the reason I don't collect books is my father used to bring home four or five books a day. Do that for 30 or 40 years. You can imagine what our house looked like. I read a lot. I read a lot about books, book collecting, whatever. But uh, I don't collect. Uh, my wife had a collection of about a thousand books on jazz. A few years ago, someone really wanted it. She said, you know, maybe five, 10 years from now, nobody's going to know who these musicians are. This person wants it. She sold it. She also has a, a small collection of Anne Frank, the diary of Anne Frank. She has a few first editions. She has about 10 or 12 different copies. There is one collection that we started as a bit of a joke. And uh, I got a book in one day, had a picture of a toilet on the cover. And the title of the book was Flush with Pride, The Life of Thomas Crapper, who invented the toilet. And uh, I brought it home. I showed it to my wife. She took one look at it and said, we have to put this in the bathroom. Now, there were books. I'll hold this up. Uh, there were books in the Victorian period and up until about World War I. A lot of them had very decorative covers. And the reason they had very decorative covers is that the publisher figured if they caught your eye in a bookstore, more chance you'd buy it. And there are people who collect books like this just for the decorative covers. You can go to the library sale, the book sales, flea markets. Some are expensive, but you can get them fairly cheaply. And individually, they might not seem like a lot, but graphically as a collection, they can be quite interesting. <clears throat> in any case, I brought this one home. My wife said, put it in the bathroom. A couple of days later, I got another book with a big eye staring out of the cover. I uh, figured with an eye staring at you, uh, put that in the bathroom. Now the title was We Never Sleep. It was the history of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. But again, with a big eye staring at you, I said, put that in the bathroom. This is a little half bathroom. There's no shower, no steam. Next thing you know, we built bookshelves. And now there are about 400 of these Victorian style illustrated books in the bathroom. People walk in, they're a little taken aback, loads of reading material. And one of the rules of the collection is that nothing can be valuable because every once in a while a book falls off the shelf 
and you can imagine where it ends up. Um, it, it's getting on a little. I'll take a few questions. Let me just mention a couple of things. We're not going to get to everything. There just isn't time. But don't ever hesitate to email, call, send photos. I do a podcast called Brattlecast, where I have about 100 episodes out, just 15, 20 minutes of telling stories like this. So if you like the stories, I can go on and on. Matter of fact, when you ask someone a question who loves what they do, the problem usually isn't getting an answer. It's getting them to stop answering. In any case, why don't we, because I have a few stories that I like to finish with. So why don't we see if there are a few questions. I'll do one or two of the appraisals that people sent in ahead, and then we'll go from there. We actually have one question. Uh, actually, we have more than one. We have two questions so far. Okay. Uh, well, one of them was, she says, I have a very old book that needs repair. The top cover is loose. I sent in photos of it for appraisal. Who repairs old books? Um, well, first of all, one of the things is, uh, I'm not sure which book they um, said, but one was a religious book. One, in any case, first of all, collectors like books in the original condition, as close they can get as to perfect, and it can make a huge difference in price. They're really fine as opposed to the other. But also, uh, when you care for books, what I tell people is that's sort of an extension. How do you care for old books? Uh, if you're comfortable, the books will be comfortable. If you're not too hot, too cold, too damp, too dry. Now, damp can sometimes be a problem in Falmouth, but if you keep them, they've lasted a long time. They'll probably last a whole lot longer than we will. Uh, so if you're dealing with the average book, just don't abuse them. Uh, also don't keep them in sunlight because they'll fade. Uh, but repairing and fixing items, book binders who are really good are craftsmen. They have to send their uh, kids to college. They have to pay for the food. They have to pay rent. It's expensive. And if you have a $5 book and you put a $500 repair into it, you're still going to have a repaired $5 book. If you have a $5,000 book and you put a few hundred dollar repair, well, maybe that makes sense. Now, that's on a monetary basis. On a um, sentimental basis, Many times people will bring in a family book that's been handed down generation to generation to generation. And then, you know, whether you get it repaired or fixed, I mean, that's more a sentimental decision. Many times I recommend don't get it fixed, but maybe the binder can make a really beautiful box for you. So you see this beautiful box on the shelf and the book, the original is in it. Uh, a few of the books that got uh, sent in there was one on the Annals of American Revolution, Indian Wars, um, and it was done in 1804. Now that 1804 sounds really uh, old, but the Re American Revolution was in the 1770s. The Indian Wars, a lot of them were in the 1600s. And books are usually more valuable when they're contemporary to what they're talking about. In other words, a book about the revolution in the revolution is better than a book during the bicentennial about the revolution. Uh, this one was done in Hartford uh, by Jedediah Morse, who also did a lot of dictionary work. He's more well known for that. But um, in, uh, it's probably about a 50, maybe a hundred dollar book. Uh, there was another one on the uh, life and eulogies of Washington in 1800 in Boston. Washington died in 1799. Almost every town in the United States at the time, in the common or at churches, they did eulogies of Washington. There were a lot of them around. They're nice. Again, they can sell $25, $50, $75. But as far as repair work, usually the advice is have someone really look at it closely. And if they wanna resend the picture with specifically with, should I get this repaired? Uh, I can give you an idea of what the exact value, whether I think it is. And then I have a number of different um, binders that I recommend, uh, but there was nothing that anybody sent ahead that I would have thought would have covered, made sense to pay the binder financially. Now, sentimentally, I can't answer that. 
You said there was another question. Yeah, and also for the email, it's the Brattle Bookshop email, right? I'll yeah, type, if, I'll type someone, that into if someone box. Google's Brattle Bookshop, yeah. our website comes up, all of the contact information is there. Okay, and I'll type it in the box. Yeah. And then the other question had a couple. What's the best way to store old books? Should, should they be handled? And how do you know if a book is a first edition? Well, that's that. those are questions that could take hours to answer. But I think I answered the part about handling and or storing. Again, if you're comfortable, unless you're talking about books worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, which I assume you're not, uh, just be careful. And again, being in Falmouth, uh, you probably want to make sure things are dehumidified and not too damp. One of the things that I'm sure that shows up at every yard sale or library sale is probably Joseph C. Lincoln books that are somewhat mildewed because they've been around for 40, 50, 70 years. And, and if they were in unheated summer houses, they tend to get damp. So that's probably the main thing. And as far as telling what a first edition is, usually when I do talks live, the easiest thing is to tell what's not a first edition. In other words, if a book was copyrighted in 1900, but you see the printing date is 2000, chances are there were copies in between. So if those, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, if it's printed much later than copyright, copyright date doesn't mean anything because the copyright date never changes. But if the date it's published and the copyright date are the same, then it's probably an indication you should look more closely. But there are things like you have to look like a piece of type broke on page 29, line 16. Sometimes there are whole books called bibliographies that sometimes can be hundreds of pages long, just telling how you can tell the first from the second, from the third, from the fourth. So it's, it's a complicated process and it's not uniform. Publishers, all publishers don't do it the same way. So that's a question if you had specific books, either I can look at them. If you line them up again on a shelf and take pictures, a lot of times what I can do is I can say, well, the third book from the right, that's the one you want to check. Or the second book down. And I can look and see, well, it's not the right publisher. The condition isn't right. And that's probably the easiest way to start. Okay, and I have two similar questions, actually. Are you interested in old newspapers that are you interested in letters from the Civil War? Uh, both of them, almost every general question you ask me, I can say it depends. Uh, I love old newspapers. And the interesting thing about old newspapers is 20th century pa papers or even 21st century papers are sometimes really problematic or late 19th century because the paper they're done on is so crumbly. And I mean, they're made to last a day. And a lot of them, they get to the point where you just touch them and they fall apart in your hands. But if you have a newspaper from the revolution, the paper was a whole different quality. And you can actually open, read, handle, or the Civil War. When, the, when it gets real problematic is around the Industrial Revolution, when they went from using rag content to wood content and manufacture. The thing is, back in the Revolution and back in that early days, paper and books were very expensive because of the way they were processed. But I love old newspapers. I had one once from the 1770s. Mm. It was talking about the Boston Massacre. And you're reading, it was a Salem newspaper re recounting what was going on at the Boston Massacre. And you're saying to yourself, somebody in Salem in the 1770s probably was getting their first information about what happened. But then there was another interesting part about it. The first sentence, I was reading it and it went on and on and on. And I finally stopped and counted. The first sentence was 125 words long. And I guarantee you, nobody in the New York Times or the Boston Globe would ever get that by an editor. Uh, so, but you still, you're holding that in, and you realize how people were reading history. Another time in the Civil War, I had two newspapers about one of the battles in Virginia. One was a New York paper. One was a Richmond paper. So one was a Confederate. One was a Yankee. And you read about 
the Civil War, the same battle, the same time, the same thing. And it was like you were reading two different accounts or you were reading two, but you were like reading two totally different battles. And you really realize that, uh, that saying that the victor writes the history, you could see how that happens because you read one account and it seems totally different than the other. Uh, so that's fun. Now, letters from the Civil War, there are actually lots of letters from the Civil War. Or anytime you're dealing with letters and journals, it's what the content is, how well written it is. When you read it, does it bring it to life? If it's sort of, it rained, it's cold, the food was bad, whatever, that's one type of letter that there are a million of them out there, people save them. If there's something special in that, that can really make it. I one time had a diary from the Civil War. In most diaries, you know, they run a few hundred dollars. Some are special. Obviously, if you have a general's diary or what I would love to have is a cook's diary who just tells you about how you feed the troops. I've never seen one. But I had one and it was sort of the standard, you know, day to day, the battle here. But what made this diary, there were two pages in about a 200 page diary. They had a day off and in the day off, they played a baseball game. And this person recounted in this baseball game, he got run down on the bases, he got hit by a ball and he jammed his leg sliding in. He said, I've had more injury in this one baseball game than I've had in two years of civil battle in the civil war. But because it mentioned baseball, it went from being a $200 to a $10,000 diary because civil war accounts of baseball, I assure you are rare and baseball collectors are avid. So it's, it's what the content is, how they wrote, what they're writing about and partly who wrote it. Obviously, if you had Abraham Lincoln's Civil War diary, you know, all you need is a scribble, it's worth a lot. So that's a quick answer, but the easiest thing you can do with a diary to help an appraiser would be someone has to read it. And then if you can make like a one or two page summary, usually we can get a pretty good idea from that. Okay. And someone asked, what was the most valuable book you've ever dealt with? And what was the book you've been most excited about? Well, there are so many uh, valuable books. Uh, a couple of things. We one time, there's a, 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 a large set called the Amer Indian Tribes of North America by a man named Curtis. There were 700 photographs. I had a set once. I brought it home. I turned the pages. My wife and I and kids got to look at it. My children were in school at the time. They wanted to bring it to school for show and tell. We said, no, nah, not a good idea. Uh, that set now would sell in the millions of dollars, but we got to hold it and touch it. Uh, but the most valuable book, and I've had books. Uh, one time I had to do an appraisal of people might not know this, but Isaac Newton's classic book uh, is called Principia Mathematica. It was done in the 1600s. It was the foundation for calculus. Uh, a good first edition sells over a million dollars. The one I got to hold and touch and appraise was Isaac Newton's copy with notes wow. in the margins. I mean, it, it's amazing. The most valuable book though, and this is, this is an answer that I stole from a colleague of mine, but I asked him permission. I heard him get asked this in a lecture once. He gave a, an answer and I said, you know, that means a lot to me. I asked him if I could sell. I have a copy of The Night Before Christmas. It's a very nicely illustrated older copy. That particular copy of The Night Before Christmas, and I love reading when my children, when my daughters were growing up, every night I would read to them and my, one of my big disappointments when they got old enough and said enough, stop. Uh, I mean, it went on for years, but every night, Christmas Eve, I read the night before Christmas to them from this copy. And we've done it, they're in their mid thirties now. Uh, one of my daughters, she married someone from Texas. She lives in the Boston area, but they were in Texas for Christmas Eve. So I, it was before FaceTime, I had to put it on YouTube so on Christmas Eve, she could watch me reading it to her. Now, if she's out of town, I do it on FaceTime. She has a one-year-old son. So now I read it to my grandson. 
my other daughter lives in Nairobi. So I have to read it to her and I have to account for eight hours of time. But that one copy of the night before Christmas that I have read to my children every single night for over Christmas Eve for over 30 years, I think is the most valuable book I have. It means the most to me. It's the most sentimentally valuable and the emotion that goes with it. So that's the most valuable book. Uh, I'll tell you what, we're getting close to the time. I'm gonna tell um, an, another story and I'll, I'll end on that. Anyone who didn't get through, anyone who has questions, like I say, just get in touch. Uh, hopefully soon I'll be able to start doing talks in person and live. And usually then I stay and do a lot more appraisals, but it, Zoom is great. It's not perfect. What you lose out, although I've had people on Zoom lectures from Cape Town, from Sweden, so it has its advantages. But the last story is, I like to end talking about Bibles. And one of the reasons I like to do that, the Bible is the most commonly printed book of all time, always has been, probably always will be. And sometimes we get five and 10 calls a week with people who have 100, 200 year old family Bibles and they wanna know how valuable they are. And in most cases, we have to say, if this is your family Bible, and it's been handed down through the generations, sentimentally, it's priceless. Monetarily, maybe not so much. Now, there are exceptions. There's the Gutenberg Bible that was done in the 1400s. It was probably worth millions or hundreds of millions. There are others. So it's always worth checking. Or those big old Victorian Bibles with the beautifully embossed covers and the clasps, they sell generally $100, two, three hundred dollars if they're in perfect shape, they make great gifts for ministers, priests, divinity students. Break a class, break a hinge, they lose all that value. Sometimes in the beginning, middle of end of those, though they have family histories, birth, deaths, marriages, the local historical or genealogical society usually want that information. They either photocopy it, Xerox it, and they love it, but they don't want the whole big old Bible It takes up too much room. Uh, and like I say, there are exceptions, but I got called to an old church in Boston, well over a hundred year old church. And they wanted me in there because uh, they, over the years and years, they had a huge library, they had just accumulated books and they wanted to know if anything was valuable. And I spent a day there and they had actually had some nice books, spent a day, it was fun. At the end of the day, the priest said to me, could you come down the basement? There were a few more books went down the basement, looked at a few more books. And then there was a closet. It was almost more like a small room off in a corner. The priest opened the door, front to ceiling, floor to top to bottom, front to back, floor. To, it was just stuffed with thousands of old Bibles. And I looked at the priest and I said, what is this? And he said, well, people hate to throw away a book. They feel it's sacrilegious to throw away a Bible. So what happens when a parishioner dies? The family comes and presents the Bible to the church. And he says, what do we do? We very graciously accept it. We don't want to offend anybody. Then we go downstairs, open the door, put it in with the rest of them. And he says, and we can't drive a dumpster up to the back of the church and fill it full of Bibles. That would just be terrible. So I use it as an example to say that if you want to give something to a charity, ask them if they want it first. If they want it and can use it, fabulous. But if all you're doing is taking your old, you're really not doing anyone a favor. Like I say, I'm gonna end things here since I only work half a day. I do get in at 5.30 in the morning. I know tomorrow morning we have to move about 3000 books in another estate. It's gonna be well over 90 degrees, but that's what I like doing. Uh, and if any of you, like I say, have any follow-ups, uh, pictures, emails, call, ask, as you can tell, I like what I do. It's getting me to stop answering. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. It was a great talk. And thanks. Again, visit Ken's website. And if you don't have the email here, and he'll be happy to hear or from call, you. phone, or stop in, whatever. That's right. <laughs> thanks for coming, everyone. And thank you, Ken. Have a great night. You too. Everybody Bye -bye. else too. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.